so uh, tonight's message is going to be a real simple one. I knew we wouldn't have a lot of folks here, and I want to tell you what I was thinking about uh, in preparation for this sermon. I was thinking in terms of something, you know, and I might do this in a different way on another day, or maybe I'll be able to use this video, I don't know, but something that we would make available for people who just get saved. You know, it's like they just get saved, and then it's like, what next? And so after somebody gets saved, we want to give them basically the fundamentals of what to do. And, uh, you know, that would include, of course, baptism. Well, on our website, you know, we've got a video not only of how to go to heaven, you know, the Bible way to heaven, but then we've got a video that tells people about baptism. And are they ready to be baptized and what does, uh, re what, what's required for baptism? And, and of course, we understand that if somebody wants to be baptized, we're going to find out if they're saved. And so we want to always give them first the gospel and get them saved. And then it explains baptism. And then the third thing, there's a video on there that explains, you know, the importance of being part of a church and, uh, and joining a church and not forsaking the assembling together. <laughs> so in this message, what I want to preach would be kind of like the fundamentals of, um, you know, what a Christian should do once they're saved. You know, there might be uh, different levels of spiritual growth, different amounts of dedication to serving the Lord. We see that even among mature Christians have been saved for a long time. But even what I'm going to preach tonight as the fundamentals of what a Christian must do uh, to follow the Lord and to live the Christian life. Um, even mature Christians have been saved for a long time. They'll find themselves for one reason or another growing stagnant in their walk for the Lord. In fact, a lot of times young Christians get saved and they're on fire for the Lord and you see them doing all these things that I'm going to talk about. And so this message would be towards people who just got saved, want to know what do I do now? Hopefully they'll they would eat this type of stuff up. They would be doing this, these things, and they would serve the Lord, and they'd see a lot of growth in their life. But sometimes what we see is there's a huge growth, and then all of a sudden things kind of fizzle out a little bit, and people kind of lose their uh, their zeal for the Lord, and maybe even will begin to just kind of grow stagnant in their walk and grow kind of distant from the Lord. Of course, the Lord always says, you know, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. So it's like anytime you feel like, hey, I feel so distant from God. I'm not hearing his voice. I'm not feeling the, his presence in my life. Well, the answer is, you know, you need to recognize that, turn and begin to go his direction. And he's always going to come and, uh, and meet you and have a great relationship. He's just waiting for you to uh, come back. But here's what I found in the years of being in the ministry you know, I was saved at about eight years old, and I've seen a lot of people, even my own family, in my own life, and a lot of people that I've known, a lot of people that I've seen in the church, preachers and, uh, and others, who I've watched go through these cycles. And I've had a lot of people, you know, more specifically since I've been in full-time ministry, we would call it, you know, actually doing this uh, regularly for the church as kind of a, a career or a job, if you will. A lot of people have reached out to me and been like, you know, why don't I feel saved? Some would even think, you know, that I know you can't lose your salvation, but I don't feel saved. You know, I don't feel like my walk is where it should be. I don't know why anything aren't happening. Why have I lost the zeal that I once have? And a lot of times people that have been saved for a long time can grow kind of distant from God. And I always say, you know, usually I would say this is the case. In rare occasions, you'll find somebody never really, you know, never really did get saved. It would, they've just been faking it or whatever. But typically, they're saved, and they've just grown distant. And the reason they don't feel that presence of the Lord is because they're not walking with the Lord. And so they're living in sin, maybe. Uh, maybe there's some of these things that I'm going to mention tonight uh, that they're not doing. And if they would do these things, then their relationship would, would uh, grow, and they'd come back and feel kind of like that fire that they did when they first got saved and, and got, uh, you know, busy about serving the Lord. So uh, basically there's four points, and I just titled the message, The Big Four. Okay, the big four. These are the four things that every Christian ought to regularly analyze in their own life and just say, hey, am I doing these four things? 
You know, how, how am I doing in these areas? Okay, so the number one thing I would say is church attendance. After somebody gets baptized, I'm not going to labor on that because that's kind of a different matter. But after they're saved, we want to get them baptized. After they're baptized, you know, we, as a rule of thumb, you know, there's some exceptions here, but as a rule of thumb, when somebody's baptized, we've already, uh, uh, you know, we've already acknowledged their salvation. And now through their baptism, you know, we're going to automatically join them to the church by their, by their baptism. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody gets baptized as part of the church because after somebody gets saved, you know, they might want to get baptized right then and there. I'm all for that. That's biblical. Well, that's what we see Philip doing with the Ethiopian eunuch, you know. That doesn't necessarily make them part of the church. That's just fulfilling the, uh, uh, the, the commission there. Uh, but in the church, if we've, seen, if we've acknowledged their salvation and we've went ahead and baptized them, most likely we would want them to join the church. And so that's going to be the next thing they do. Okay, so church attendance. <clears throat> Why is it important to go to church regularly or to even be part of a church? You know, we see people all the time. As we're knocking on doors, everybody in this room goes soul winning pretty regularly, and we hear it all the time. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm not a church person. Like I, I believe, and I read the Bible, and I do this, but I don't think you have to go to church. Who's all heard somebody say that all the time? Well, they say this is my church, you know, or, or I go to the woods and and, and nature is my church or whatever. And well, you don't understand the biblical meaning of church, because church is a, is is literally. Other believers congregate together, and you're like a church family gathering, you know, for a specific purpose as one body. That's the church. You know, so a lot of people will say, well, the church is the people. Well, not necessarily. If, if everybody's just scattered all over the world, you know, they're not necessarily the church at that time because church means a congregation or an assembly. So when they come together, they're a church. Now, theoretically, you know, one day we'll all meet up in heaven in one huge assembly. And spiritually speaking, you could say we're seated already in heavenly places, the Bible talks about. You know, so in a manner of speaking, you could say that we're all the church, everybody in the world that's saved. Uh, but you get into kind of a universalist idea. And, uh, and you know, we typically just talk about the local church. So like the specific place where people meet. And there's churches all over in the Bible. Most of the time it uses that word, it's churches, it's plural, because there's more than one uh, body that assembles that way. So obviously um, we know our attendance is really low today. And I'm not criticizing people aren't here. I've made it very clear that we're going to go ahead and have service here. But I understand that people had different things. They're going to be uh, different places. But obviously I'm talking to people in this room that are very faithful to church. They come a lot. They come every time the doors open. And, uh, and that is, a, that is a, a great place to be. There's something to be said. There's something special about having that mindset that if my church family's meeting, if the doors are open, there's going to be preaching, there's going to be singing or whatever, I want to be there. I want to be a part of that. And I'm going to tell you that the more that you can be part of that, the more you're going to feel the presence of God and the uplifting uh, you know, that your brothers and sisters can bring. And the more closely you're going to walk with the Lord as a result of that. You know, this is why we try to offer uh, services as, as much as possible, as frequently as possible. <clears throat> because you go too many days without that gathering together with the saints, you're going to start feeling it, you know. And I always use this analogy. It was taught to me whenever I was younger. But, you know, from Sunday to Sunday is a long way. And they use the analogy of like a clothesline, which hardly anyone uses a clothesline anymore. But everybody in here knows what that is, right? Maybe you used to put clothes on the clothesline or maybe mom did or grandma. And what happens is as you start hanging those clothes on the line, it gets real you know, saggy in the middle. So some have said that that midweek service, Wednesday in Iola, it's Thursday here. It's kind of like that, that piece of wood, that, that two by four that they used to put up in the center of that clothesline because it sags in the middle. So they have to put that center out there. So it just kind of goes like that. In our week, you know, all the things that we're exposed to uh, out in the world or the media, television, I mean, anything that, uh, that clouds our mind, just, you know, think about how many hours a day you're at work and none of us work in environments you know, except for me, where <laughs> we're pr primarily around Christians all the, you know, most of the time. Okay. Uh, and so we need each other. We need to attend church. And right after somebody gets saved, that's the first thing I would tell them is, hey, now 
uh, you know, I, I, of course, you don't need to go to church to be saved. And this is why, you know, I skip right over all that whenever I'm giving somebody the gospel because we want them to know, hey, it's not important, it's not as important what church you go to as it is. Do you know for sure you're saved? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? But once they're saved, we, we want to encourage them. You, you need to get involved. You need to come to church. We don't gain anything from it necessarily, you know. Uh, sure, ideally, everybody that attends church would tithe and, you know, that would support the work and everything. But we're not even worried about that. We don't hound people about that and make sure that they're paying exactly 10% or, or tithes and offerings, so above the 10%. No, we just want them to come. We want them to grow. We want them to be part of the family. And that's something, you know, that they can let the Lord deal on, on their heart if they want to support the work or not. Uh, but that's not what church is about. Contrary to what a lot of churches out there and mega churches, you know, and places that are constantly just trying to get money out of all the people that come, that's not it. We just need one another and we need to... Uh, fulfill the third part of the commission, which is, you know, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? Baptize those who believe, and then teach them to observe all things that he's taught us, right? So we've actually, basically, we're going to disciple them after we, they're saved and we get them in church. We're going to disciple them. So we need that. It's very important. So there in Hebrews chapter 10, I don't know if you're still there or not, but this is a famous verse that's this is the main verse i guess that you would take somebody to and when it comes to uh you know whether or not they should go to church i always when i read this now will think about uh valerie going soul winning with me in a uh uh, uh what do you call that it's a townhouse i guess a lot of different places uh, a lot of different um uh I don't know, kind of like apartments. You know what a townhouse is. You go in, there's like three floors and, and there's lots of uh, living quarters and all, all that. And so we went down there back when we could before they kicked us, kicked us out. And we'd knock on doors to give the gospel to people. And there was a guy who I talked to who uh, was one of those guys that said, you know, I pray, I read my Bible, I'm saved, you know, but I don't go to church. And uh, the next time we were in the townhouse, this guy came out of the building and was talking to, talking to Valerie. And he said the same thing to Valerie. He said, you know, I'm saved. I, I believe the Bible. I pray and all that stuff. Uh, and I do believe the Bible. I read it all the time. He said, but I don't think you need to go to church. And she's like, well, then you haven't read the whole Bible <laughs> or something like that. She just like confronted him. Because a lot of people feel super spiritual by saying, oh, I don't need to go to church. You know, I read the Bible. I pray. Well, guess what? The Bible says not to, for, not to forsake the assembly. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. It says, not forsaking, right Right before that, it talks about considering one another, provoke one uh, to love, uh, unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Let me break that down real quick. Okay, number one, it says, forsaking, forsake not the assembling. Right now, I, I would like to say again, every time the church doors are open, we want to try to be there. But I understand things come up and, uh, and you know, I don't think somebody is in some kind of sin if they don't do that. But the idea is, hey, we need to strive to meet together and to not forsake as the manner of some is. You know, there are some people out there who don't assemble together. They got saved and they just, you know wander around and uh, claim that they're going to read the Bible on their own. Maybe they watch TV, uh, preacher on TV at home or whatever. No, that's not going to cut it. We need to assemble. We need to come together. Not, uh, and then it says, there's so much the more as you see the day approaching. And, and you know, as, as we get closer and closer to the end, I think this is the point that it's making. Now, I grew up thinking that it meant, hey, we need, more, we need to meet more times, more frequently. You know, so much the more. And well, I, I used to teach that, and that's what I was always taught, until I realized that the, the early church, it says they were meeting daily in the temple and in every house. <laughs> okay, How can you meet so much more than daily? Okay, But I think that the purpose, if you really read what it's saying here, is it's saying so much the more, as we see the day approaching, it's important that we assemble together. Not necessarily so much the more you know, as, as, a fre as a number, a frequency, you know, because, hey, we should be meeting every time that we can, but it's so important and even so much more as we see the day approaching, we need to be gathering together and, uh, and assembling to help each other out and to encourage each other. 
and to kind of get our marching orders. You think about the church as, you know, we gather, get assembled, get motivated, get pumped up, and it's like, all right, now let's go out into the world and do the things that we're supposed to be doing. It says there that we're, in verse 24, that we're supposed to provoke one another unto good works. And that's part of the same sentence if you break that down. So part of us assembling together isn't just about us. You know, do you need each other? Do you need to come to church? Do you need the preaching and the singing and the fellowship and all that? Yes, every one of us needs that. But even if you felt like, you know what, I don't really feel like I, I need that right now, which I guess if anyone felt that way, I would say, oh, you definitely need it. <laughs> but, but, you know, even if you felt like, you know, I don't really think I need it. Well, guess what? Somebody else might need you to be there. And, you know, even whenever we have, now, again, this is a special occasion. This is different. But even when we have like, like a, you know, three people or maybe just one family or something like that that's not here. And all of a sudden it changes the atmosphere. You know what I mean? It changes like that feeling that you get. And you're like, man, there's a hole in our heart, you know. But maybe that would motivate you to say, well, you know what? I'm going to go anyway, even though I don't feel like going, even though I don't necessarily you know, have this huge, you know, burden or urge to go to church right now, I'm going to go because somebody might need my presence. They might need me to encourage them. And guess what? When you come and you make yourself available to encourage other people, you're going to get something out of it as well. I always think of, uh, think of it as a gym membership. One time I remember I joined a, a, a gym and had a personal trainer even that was provided, you know, once you got that. And I remember that was the most effective like training that I've ever done. I got in the best shape. I was very motivated and dedicated. But the reason why is because number one, I paid for my membership. <laughs> I had a vested interest, right? I, I was on board. I was like, I was all in. They expected me to be there and I wanted to be there. Okay. But not only that, I had a personal trainer that was provided for me and he's saying, and, 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 and you know, I saw a lot of progress because there was somebody that could walk me through it and teach me and show me some things. You know, and then, uh, you know, as that kind of grew, I realized that, you know, a lot of people in a gym, you know, they meet up and they see the same people exercising every day or whatever, and just watching each other and, and, and seeing the results, talking to each other, motivating one another, that kind of, you know, jumped that progress of the workout, working out and, and getting in shape, it jumped to a greater level. Same thing is true with uh, people who are doing different sports or let's just say running, that's the analogy I always use. If they were actually in a running club, there are other people who are running with them and they're encouraging them and they're saying, hey, you know, we're gonna go run such and such on this day. You know, you wanna work out with us so that we can get ready for that run or whatever. They're gonna see a whole lot more progress because they're assembling together. They're, you know, two are better than one. So we need each other. We need to assemble and we need not only for ourselves, but we need to realize that we're also affecting other people. We need to be there to help them. Okay. So the number one out of the big four is church membership. And these aren't necessarily in order of importance or anything like that. I'm just, these are all things that we need to focus on. Number one, church attendance. Number two, Bible reading. All right, this is key. This is very important. Look at Psalm 119. And again, when a person has been a Christian for a while, they might get away from this. You know, there might, been a, there might have been a time when they were reading, uh, you know, at least a verse a day. You know, maybe there's a, they're doing a Proverbs uh, of the day, and that would be a chapter a day, I guess, you know, because there's 30 Proverbs. And so if you read one Proverb every day, you know, you'll read through the whole book in a month. So a lot of people would do something like that, or maybe they'll read through the Gospels, or they'll uh, just read the New Testament, you know, or whatever. And, and they start off, and they're on fire, and they're getting this down, and, there's, and they're experiencing growth, and there's a zeal for the Lord. After some time, we might just get busy. We might start doing different things and be like, you know, I don't really have time to read the Bible. I don't really have time to memorize Scripture or to study these things out. Or whatever, but the Bible makes it clear that this is majorly important. God gave us this for a reason, and I find it so interesting when you meet somebody like I've met a lot of uh, of Catholics. I can't lump them all in the same category, but I've met a lot who personally tell me, you know, I've been a Catholic for many years, and I don't know the Bible at all. 
You know, we never read the Bible. No one ever taught us the Bible. It's just not something that we did. And, uh, and I think that's a real shame because anyone that's a Christian or claims to be a Christian, you know, this is, this is the mind of God. This is the Word of God. And so, you know, the Bible talks about this being uh, like water or like food, you know, that we would eat. So look at Psalm 119, verse 11. And if you didn't know this about the Psalms, every verse in the Psalms, except for one verse, uh, and I don't know why, it seems so weird that that one verse doesn't have it, uh, but every verse in Psalm 119 mentions in it uh, some kind of uh, reference to the Word of God. It might say, uh, you know, word or precept or a statue or a law or something like that, but it's all a reference to God's Word. So chapter 119, verse 11 sa says... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 119 verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So David's purpose of hiding God's word in his heart was, hey, I don't want to sin. And if I can keep taking in God's word and considering what the law says and considering what God says that we're supposed to do, uh, then it's going to keep me from messing up. It's going to keep me from sinning because I'm going to be searching the law, searching God's Word, and applying it to my life. And so we need to be reading the Bible. Look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 verse 11 says this. As Paul would go around and he would see get people saved and he would stay there for a little while and teach them some things from the Bible... And here in this particular place, he says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So Paul himself is saying, like, these guys are noble. These Bereans, right? They, they not only listen to me teaching them the word of God, but they go and they search it out for themselves. And as a pastor, I know when somebody's engaged and someone's doing this because they'll come with questions and they'll ask questions. Say, hey, I was reading my Bible and I saw this. What do you think about this? Or, you know, hey, I met this other person that was telling me the Bible says this, but I can't find it. And what do you think about that? And I'm not saying I have all the answers, but I'm saying that shows somebody who is definitely searching the word of God. And if you're searching, you're going to find it because God is going to uh, reveal that to you if you have a heart that wants to know. And so just like these in Berea, they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things that they heard preached to them, uh, as they're assembling together, they're listening to the preacher, but they want to see if those things are so. And so they search for themselves. And of course, uh, at our church, we are King James only. Uh, there is a good reason that we, well, we do that. I'm not going to get the, into it in this message. And so, you know, we have King James Bibles that we hand out when people get saved, or maybe they come here and we'll say, hey, have this Bible. It's important for you to go home, be reading this Bible and applying it to your life. It's very important that we read the Bible. Not just for new Christians, because again, guess what happens? People are saved for a long time. They get busy and forget to read their Bible. or They just don't make time for it. <clears throat> now, the Bible uh, explains in, in a few different places, again, how, the, Bible, how, how, the, uh, how the, the, the Word of God is like water for the soul. And it talks about the washing of water. I won't get into that in Ephesians 5, uh, but... You know, also Amos says that a day is coming where there's going to be a famine. And he says it's a great famine. It's not a famine of food or of water, but of the Word of God. And, you know, he explains this as though, you know, you'd be better off with food and water than without the Word of God. And we ought to be considering that as part of our regular diet, not just food, not just water, which we need those things or else we'll die. Well, spiritually, we need the Word of God. And we need to be getting it into us and not just hearing it preached, but we need to be reading it for ourselves. And so if anyone in here is not in a regular routine of reading your Bible, I would just challenge you to get back to that. So important for your spiritual life. It isn't, an, uh, it isn't enough, like I said, uh, uh, just to hear the preaching. Uh, open up the Word. Have that time. It's kind of like God speaking to you one-on-one -on -one whenever you do it that way. And uh, on that note, 
prayer, very similar situation. You're having a conversation with God. He's talking to you through the Bible. Now you're talking to him in prayer. Very important. So that's the number three, prayer. The big four, we got church attendance. We got Bible reading. We've got prayer. One of the most overlooked and underappreciated resources that a Christian has is prayer. I mean, think about it. At any time we can go to God and it's a connection. It's like a, it's like an open line where we can go to him and just, you know, speak to him. He's not sleeping. We're not inconveniencing him. Uh, he wants us in fact to do that. And so anytime we can go to him and we can pray, look at Matthew seven, seven. You know, it's funny as these are the same things, you know, growing up that you hear, you know, not necessarily in a message like this where they're all together, but um, these are the main things that you hear over and over. People, you know, the preacher saying, hey, you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to pray. You need to read your Bible. You need to go to church. <clears throat> and after a while, you just kind of get to where, you know, yeah, that's just what you say. That's just what preachers say. That's what you have to do. But I'm telling you, it is key that we do these four things in our lives. And as we get older and they kind of get numb to it, I'm talking about older as Christians, and we kind of get numb to it, th this could devastate our relationship with God. We need to get back to, uh, to reading the Bible and to praying. Matthew 7, 7 says this. Uh, this, of course, is right after uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, he's instructing Christians how to live. And he says this, Ask, and it shall be given, given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be open unto you. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very much telling us that we need to come to God. We need to ask, seek, and knock. Uh, for everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be open. You know, now, some people will say, well, I don't understand. I pray for such and such all the time, and I don't ever get it. All right. Well, that's probably because, as James says, you're, a you're asking amiss. Right? You're asking because there's something that you want to consume on, upon your lust. Like there's something that you desire after of the flesh. That's not what he's talking about. Jesus is saying like of a spiritual nature, you know, something that's going to be spiritual, something that's going to bear fruit for the Lord. You can ask anything you want. God's going to give that to you. He's going to give you the Holy Ghost. He's going to give you uh, the wisdom. He's going to give you his mind and, uh, and power to do the things that he's called you to do for him and to be fruitful and to be right with him and to have a good service for him. Okay, so uh, so that's a, a verse that we can go to, Matthew chapter 7, on, as far as prayer goes. 1 John 5, here's a good one. And again, 1 John is to Christians. All right, this isn't, none of this is about salvation, but this is about the life of a Christian who's trying to be in good fellowship with the Lord. And in 1 John 5, verse 14, all right, so this is right after the verse in 13 that we always quote that says, Hey, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Verse 14 says, And this is the confidence we have in Him that if we ask anything, According to his will, that's the key part. See, it's got to be something that's according to his will. He hears us, heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. All right. Then it starts talking about praying for, for your brother. And James does the same thing. If somebody's in sin, maybe they're sick and it's because, you know, of a punishment of God, because we never know how God's punishing and someone's life might be falling apart and it might be the hand of God. And James talks about how we need to pray. James chapter five talks about how we need to pray for these people and, and pray that, you know, there'd be their sins be forgiven them and that they'll come back to following the Lord so that they won't be suffering these things, the, the judgment of the hand of God upon them. So we not only need to pray for our own requests and for wisdom and things for our life, but make it a, a, co a constant uh, practice that you pray for one another. And I want to get back to this as a pastor. Anybody can do this, but as a pastor, I feel like I've dropped the ball on praying for everybody, you know, who's a member or used to be a member or everybody that gets saved, whatever. And I used to have a list, you know, of all the, the members. We would say active members, inactive members, uh, you know, prospects, all these kinds of stuff. And I would go through and, and pray for everyone individually on that list. 
And I'm telling you, when you're praying for other people, you, they're at the forefront of your mind. And so you're going to be thinking about them. You're going to be uh, finding opportunities to call on them and ask them how they're doing. And, and the, it's very important. And so, you know, right there, I can I tell you, even as a pastor, a pastor can start falling away from doing these very essential things. This is the big four. All right. Church attendance, Bible reading, prayer. You know, if you feel distant from God, uh, even though you might be going to church, you might even be reading your Bible, but you just feel distance. Well, maybe you're not praying. Maybe your prayer life has been hindered, and that's uh, very key. That's very important. <clears throat> and so number four, this is something that's overlooked. And there's a lot of Christians who, who try their best to do all the things that I just mentioned. And oftentimes this last one is just something that is mentioned, something that's, pr that's uh, talked about in messages. But for some reason, Christians don't make this uh, a part of their their daily living, and that is evangelism, okay? Now, if you show up for organized soul winning and you go out, maybe you're a silent partner, gave the gospel, I never really, look, we would hope that everybody would have a chance to, to give the gospel to somebody, even if it's not friends, family, loved ones, it would be, you know, uh, somebody at the door uh, that we would call uh, cold turkey, Right. Remember, I, I talked about that recently, this article that I read. In fact, I want to share something with that about that article real quick. It was uh, the Gospel Coalition, but it was in Australia. I'm not sure if they have, a, you know, two different uh, uh, just brands or whatever. Uh, but here, here's what this article said. It said uh, that Christians need to try going back to what they called cold turkey. You know, I think it was Brother Dean that's talking to me about cold visiting, cold visits. No, it was uh, it was uh, Tim actually. Tim said that they call they used to call that cold visits, like a if you're in the business world, like you're just going to just knock on somebody's door or whatever, they would call it cold visits. But anyway, uh, so in this article it called it cold turkey. But what it is is door knocking. It's the same type of soul winning that we like to do here. And I found this very interesting because this is an evangelical church, but it's not Baptist. All right, they didn't. They don't even use uh, King James Bible. Uh, who knows what all we would agree with? I'm assuming we agree on the gospel because what I found is people that go out and they give the gospel in this manner, you know, they give the right gospel because it's just uh, it just becomes more real to you whenever you're doing it in this way. Okay, but here's what they said. They gave five points in this article of why people need to go back to uh, uh, soul winning in this manner. He says, number one. You will be reminded of how many people don't know the gospel. And that's true. You know, even though you find, I'm kind of surprised how many people call themselves Christians. Yeah, but when you, when you ask them about their faith, you ask them what they believe, you find out, man, these people don't have a clue what the gospel is. And when you're soul winning in this way, you're knocking doors, you're talking to people, you find out how many people don't know the gospel. Number two, you will pray more. You know, you will be realize that, hey, I need to pray for the boldness to go out there and do this. I need to pray for strength. I need to pray for safety. Uh, I need to pray that God will hinder us from being distracted. And, and, uh, and you know, he would restrain the dogs from barking and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you, your prayer life grows a little bit whenever your soul went in this way. Uh, number uh, three, they said you will gain a better understanding of people. This is true. As you're, you're going door to door, you're meeting all kinds of different people. You're learning how to talk to them. You're understanding backgrounds and kind of like the way that different people think. Uh, this is a good reason for or a good uh, uh, point about soul winning. Number four says this, your relational evangelism skills will improve. OK, so relational uh, evangelism, what we always called it was personal evangelism. In other words, you know, as you're just striking up a conversation with somebody, maybe somebody you work with and you're on break, or maybe it's a family, a loved one, or maybe you're riding the bus and you talk to somebody, you know, there, whatever, this would be just in your personal life, somebody that you encounter with, uh, you know, that you talk to. Not necessarily cold turkey knocking on doors, uh, but, you know, now that you've been knocking on doors and you're giving the gospel over and over and over, man, those verses come right to you. Even though you might not be ready for it, might not be prepared for it, but in your personal evangelism times, you know, the, the ver verses are there because you have the practice of soul winning. Soul winning is so important. I, I, this is why we always try to get people involved right away. After they get saved, start coming to this church. We want them to go out and just be a silent partner and learn how to do these things. Uh, okay, number five, here's the most important thing. People will get saved. 
And I'm so glad to read that in this article. They're like, hey, you know why we do it? Because it works. People get saved. Because what I hear all the time from people that don't do it is, oh, that doesn't work. We don't do it that way because it doesn't work. I think that because you're not doing it. But we, you know, it might be few and far between. It might not be as many as we like, you know, or might be some people that, you know, they say a prayer, but they didn't really trust, and, you know, they're trying to get us out of the door or whatever. But regardless, what we know is that there are people that get saved. There are people that listen to the gospel presentation and they understand it and they'll get saved. And so this is why evangelism is so important. It's so important. Everybody ought to be a part of it. Turn to John 15 and I'll give you a couple other points here. <clears throat> this is the main objection, uh, uh, I'm sorry, objective of the church, right? This is what we're called to do. Jesus said, I come to seek and to save uh, those who are lost. And so whenever he uh, gave the commission before he ascended up to heaven, he said, this is what I want you as a church to do. I want you to go out and preach the gospel. I want you to get people saved. Now think about this. If you, I don't know how many you played sports, but let's say you're on a soccer team, right? Anybody play soccer or am I speaking a different language? You can say basketball. You can say pretty much anything. Okay, but soccer, I'll just use that as an example. Uh, you could have a good goalkeeper, right? That's the person that protects the ball from going to the goal. You could have good fullbacks. You know, those are the people that are defending, uh, you know, the ball uh, as they come to, the, you know, they're protecting the goal so that the other, other team can't make points, you know? And you can have everybody organized. They know how to play their positions. They know how to do everything. But if you don't have guys up in the front taking shots, you know, to get that ball in the other person's goal, what's the point? To have this strong defense but have no offense whatsoever, you know, you're not the point of the game is to get more points than the other team. So if you don't take any shots and you don't know how to make goals, you can sit there and defend all you want, but it's not gonna do, it's not gonna do any good. You know, in the business world, every job has something that they're supposed to be producing or some service that they're supposed to be providing. Well, it doesn't matter how organized they are, how many policies they have in place, how legal they are, uh, all these things that they might spend a lot of time getting ready, how beautiful the building is or something. None of those things matter if they're not producing whatever it is they're supposed to be producing. If they're not, off, if they're not doing the service that they're supposed to be providing. If they're not doing that, they're not gonna make money, they're not gonna be successful. What's the point of even having the business? All right, so Jesus left his church you know, behind churches, whatever you want to look at it, behind on this earth as he went up to heaven and he said, I want you to occupy till I come. I want you to go out and do the work. I want you to do what I was called to do. You're going to carry on that work. In fact, he said, you're going to do greater works than I. All right, because we can do it in greater numbers because we have so many people and we have just the, the laws of compound interest, you know, <laughs> And we're going to go into the world and we're going to do what God left us here to do. And that is to reach people and to bear fruit. Okay, so I told you to turn to John 15. Let me read the first five verses. It says, I, this is Jesus uh, talking to his disciples here. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. That sounds very similar to the washing of the water of the word that I've talked about earlier. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. Uh, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Verse six, uh, if I, uh, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is, uh, as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. You know, he says the goal here, here's how my father's glorified that you bear much fruit. Now, how is a branch going to bear fruit? I mean, think about a branch that's disconnected from the, the tree. We'll, we'll say tree instead of vine. Same, uh, same principle. You got this branch that's just on the ground. Let's say it's an apple tree, and you're looking at the branch, and you're just like, how come it's not producing apples? I don't get it because it's not connected to the tree, right? So we want to stay connected to the tree, 
and we want to get the strength of God in us, and we want to be clean and pur purified, or as it says right here, purged, all the bad stuff out, all the rot, all the disease, all the bugs. We want to get those all out of us so that we can be just a conduit and allow God's power to flow through us so that we can produce fruit. And it says, talking about withered or being thrown into the fire, it's not talking about hell. Or you got to stick with the analogy. The analogy is about bringing forth fruit. God wants us to bring forth, you know, here's a bit saying basically, if you're not bringing forth fruit, you're good for nothing. It's kind of like the same analogy where he said, you know, you're the salt of the world. But if the salt has lost its savor, what good is it? You know, you're the light of the world, but if the light's under a bushel, what good is it? He's not saying, you know, you're going to lose your salvation or anything like that. He's just saying you're not good for anything if you're a branch that's not producing fruit. How do we produce fruit as a branch? You got to be connected to the vine. Okay, so very important that we as Christians, you know, do all the, in fact, all these things, going to church, reading the Bible, praying, you know what they're going to allow us to do? They're going to allow us to be clean. They're going to allow us to be holy, sanctified. And by doing that, we're going to be more useful for the Lord to, to do what it is He's called us to do, which is winning souls for Him. So, again, I know the simple message, and I know everybody in here is like, hey, man, this is pretty basic. That's not really deep stuff. But here's the thing. Not only is this what, a new believer needs to hear. Someone who gets saved needs to know, hey, I need to go to church. I need to read my Bible. I need to pray, and I need to get involved in evangelism. This is, this is, these are the big four. These are what I need to do. But also, we veterans, you know, we mature Christians, been saved for a long time, we can fall short of each and every one of these. And I'm going to tell you, a huge struggle in my life, I've admitted many times, is prayer. I'll try to get back. Now, obviously, you pray before you eat. You pray for special occasions. You just pray, uh, you know, I might pray before I go on a trip, or I might pray. There's different times I hear about somebody who's sick. I might pray for them. But look, what I need to get back to doing, I know, and what I would encourage everybody in here to, is to get back to these times where you set aside a part of your day you know, preferably as early in the morning as you can and not just read your Bible, but have a time where you pray for the spiritual strength and, and abilities that God needs, that you need from God and wisdom. Pray for others who you know uh, in your life who are struggling, um, you know, that need to be brought back to the Lord. We need to be involved in prayer. And then obviously we need to continue in evangelism. That's why we just had that Focus on Evangelism conference uh, because even though most of us go soul winning, we know the basics of soul winning. We need to be reminded about why it is we do what we do and how exactly we go about doing it. And so these are things for, for everybody. This is These are the big four uh, that we need to be focused on. All right, let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and thank you for the job that you've called us to do. I pray that you'll equip us and allow us to be able to do that. Help us to be reminded that we need to seek you and we need to draw nigh unto you. You're not just going to grant us with these things without us making the effort to receive them. Help us to be, abide in the vine that we might bear much fruit for you. And Lord, I pray that you'll help to keep in mind these simple things, uh, these priorities that we have as Christians that we must be about doing. And I pray that you would uh, uh, bless all those who came tonight and anyone that might watch this on the, on the live stream or the recording. Lord, I pray that you'll just apply these simple truths to our hearts that we might take them seriously and do them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.